Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar, uh, Silent Behavior Council webinar, the first in the series uh, this time. My name is Aoko Olua Yomi. I'm a co chair of uh, Silent Behavior Council, and we welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everywhere you are today. Um, for a start, um, the chair for today's uh, webinar is uh, Nathan DeJong. Uh, PhD candidate of University of Colorado. Um, it will be helping us to, uh, to go along with the speakers and make sure that we have a nice time here today. Um, um, I'll pass over the button to, uh, to the John to help us to move along the webinar. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Alko. So, I'm gonna introduce our first speaker, Dr. Jen Blankenship. She is a PhD from the, she has a PhD from the University of Massachusetts and completed her postdoctoral training at the University of Colorado. She is a clinical scientist with expertise in applying wearable and connected technologies to understand the impact of sedentary behaviors and activity on cardiometabolic disease risk in a range of clinical populations. Hi, my name is Jen Blankenship, and I'm a clinical scientist at VivoSense, a science and analytics company specializing in using wearable monitoring technologies. I am going to talk to you today about how to record and measure sedentary behaviors. Sedentary behavior is an incredibly important lifestyle factor in modern society. We know that sedentary behavior is very common and prevalent throughout our daily routines. We sit a lot at our desks at work, we sit for leisure, and it's um, associated with a lot of poor health outcomes, including increased risk for obesity, cancer, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. Broadly, we know that sedentary behavior is really bad for health, but we're still trying to understand how modifying the accumulation of sedentary behavior and how reducing it impacts health outcomes in a variety of populations. Central to these questions is measurement of sedentary behavior. We need to make sure that we're using the right tools to measure this lifestyle factor to better understand its health impacts and guide future health guidelines. So today we're going to talk about how you go about measuring sedentary behavior. We'll begin today's discussion by defining sedentary behavior and understanding the key components of that definition that are measurable with tools that are available today. We'll then go into common sedentary behavior measurement approaches and the advantages and disadvantages of those approaches. And we'll end by uh, posing some questions to you that you should ask yourself as you're deciding on the tool to use to measure sedentary behavior for your population. Now, before we start talking about the actual measurement of sedentary behavior, I think it's important we set the stage and uh, agree on some context. So historically, there was a lot of ambiguity in how sedentary behavior was actually defined by researchers. And this was recognized by a lot of um, a lot of researchers in the field. And so the Sedentary Behavior Research Network was born. For those of you not familiar with this, it is an organization uh, compiled of a bunch of researchers and health professionals who are focused on specifically the health impacts of sedentary behavior. And they convened an expert panel to define what sedentary behavior is to allow for effective crosstalk between disciplines. The definition agreed upon by this expert group is that sedentary behavior is comprised of three main components. It's an any waking behavior that has a low energy expenditure, less than 1.5 mets, performed in a seated, reclined, or lying position. So these components are really important to think about as we understand and uh, decide on the tool used to measure sedentary behavior. Anytime we talk about measurement tools, it's important to remember that one size does not fit all. There's not going to be one tool that's perfect for every population in every context and every question. The selection of your measurement tool for sedentary behavior or 
any variable for that matter, is going to depend on many factors from the population that you're studying to the outcome measure that you're most interested in. Today we'll talk about tools that are available to you to measure sedentary behavior and uh, think about, as we're going through this, the questions you are most interested in to decide which tool is most appropriate for you. There are a lot of tools available to measure sedentary behavior. Today we're going to focus on two major uh, approaches, self-reported measures through validated questionnaires and objective monitoring of sedentary behavior. And this can be broken out um, into consumer grade devices and research grade devices worn on different body locations. And we'll discuss the impact of these different device types and wear locations on the actual measurement of sedentary behavior and your outcomes. We're going to start the discussion today with self-reported questionnaires. And I think a lot of people will tend to blow right past these as an option to measure sedentary behavior. But there's a lot of value in using these kinds of questionnaires because they can provide context to why someone is sedentary. Maybe it's an acute illness or injury, or their occupation leads them to spend lots of time um, sitting at their desk, and uh, or perhaps they're not motivated, or they live in an environment where it's not safe to go outside and walk around. All of these factors go in to drive someone's decision to either be sedentary or not. Of course, with any subjective measure, there is error. And there will be error with any tool that you use to measure sedentary behavior. In this case, with validated, even validated questionnaires, you're asking someone to remember something that happens most of their day. So it can be really difficult to remember um, mundane events like how much time did you spend sitting at your desk? Uh, it's a lot easier for people to remember structured events that don't happen very often, like when did you exercise today? or did you even exercise? That being said, there are a lot of questionnaires available to measure sedentary behavior, and the, the exact one that is appropriate for your population is going to be different and dependent on lots of factors, of, as I've previously alluded to. The Sedentary Behavior Research Network has um, a, a section of their website dedicated to subjective questionnaires and validated tools, which I'd encourage you to visit if you're interested in using this kind of measurement tool to, for sedentary behavior measurement in your study. Commercially available wearable sensors like Fitbits or Apple Watches or an Aura Ring are also an interesting way to add sedentary behavior measurement to your research study. And I think that there is a place for these tools in, in research. The um, wearable market has exploded in the last decade and resulted in a lot of different types of devices that come in different form factors, all at different price points. Some people already use these devices um, and really enjoy uh, having them in their lives. So this is potentially a very cost effective tool to add a layer of objective measurement of sedentary behavior to your research study. That being said, you need to be aware that most of these devices aren't going to give you an acceleration signal. Um, you're going to get the summary outcome measure that you might be interested in, like time spent sedentary. But how that device takes the raw acceleration signals and turns it into your outcome measure is unknown. You don't know the algorithms. Those are often kept proprietary. Um, and you also may not know whether that algorithm and the data processing methods uh, are the same throughout the life cycle or the life course of your study. And so this is something that is potentially um, uh, problematic if you have a longitudinal study where you're collecting data over years at a time or even a single year. We know that the pace of research and the pace of a consumer demand are very different. So um, at the start of a study, you may begin with the hottest type of um, device, but by the end of your study, that device might be obsolete. Beyond that, 
Do we have researchers who are working hard to validate these commercially available tools? But the challenge is that by the time that the study is finished and the data are published in peer-reviewed manuscripts, those devices are often obsolete. So this paper um, that I've cited here is from 2020, which validated the Apple Watch 4, and it's 2021 now, one year later, and Apple is getting ready to release the Apple Watch 7. So these are things you need to consider, not deal breakers, but factors to keep in mind if you're going with a commercially available wearable sensor. Research grade accelerometers have been used for decades to measure physical activity and sedentary behavior. There's a lot of different places that these devices can be worn, and the simple answer is that there's no perfect answer for where you should put your monitor on a participant. But the wear location will dramatically impact the accuracy of measuring sedentary behavior. So in a study by Marcotte and colleagues, they looked at 48 young adults wearing accelerometers on the wrist and the hip. And they process their data using 13 different approaches from simple cut points to machine learning techniques. Broadly, if, uh, and these uh, data were from the accelerometers were compared to direct observation. So what they looked at is the percent agreement um, for uh, correct classification of sedentary behavior by the accelerometer compared to direct observation. And if you look broadly at this table in that first column, the percent agreement is much higher at the hip location compared to the wrist location. And if you look within each uh, wear location, each row represents a different measurement or data processing technique. There's variability even within one wear location as to how accurate each sedentary behavior measurement is. So when you're thinking about research grade uh, monitors, you need to consider both where location and how your data are going to be processed. That being said, the wrist location has become very popular in measuring sedentary behavior and other lifestyle factors because it's very, um, people are used to wearing things on their wrist and there is high levels of adherence. So there is a balancing act between the accuracy and precision of your measurement and what people are willing to actually do. Research grade accelerometers are also worn, could also be worn directly on the thigh. This device called the ActivePal is a flat monitor that's worn on the midline of the thigh directly on the skin and has both an accelerometer and an inclinometer, which allows this device to differentiate body posture. So if someone is in a seated position, the monitor will be lying flat. And if they stand up, their leg will move and put their leg in an upright position. So as a result, this device can accurately quantify time spent sedentary standing and stepping. And because we can detect these different postures, we can get at questions like how many times does someone get up from sitting or break up their sitting? And how long are those sitting bouts actually? Now, one thing you need to consider is that the threshold that the device, um, the threshold for detecting a sitting or upright event can be changed. So the default is that a person needs to be in one body posture, either sitting or upright, for 10 seconds. And that period of time is called the minimum sitting upright period. But that number, that threshold, can be modified and changed through these device settings. It might be something you want to consider when you think about different populations. So for example, this uh, graph is from a study of pediatric, po pediatric um, uh, population, where they looked at the number of breaks per hour over the course of a day using different thresholds of sensitivity for detecting sitting or upright events. Now, if we think about how a pediatric population might move differently than, say, an adult population, their movement's a lot more sporadic and, and quick. And so using a lower threshold to detect a change in body posture might be more appropriate. And you can see with the solid line on this figure that a lower um, threshold results in detecting significantly more breaks in sitting per hour compared to the uh, default threshold, which is shown in that dotted line. 
Now, these types of settings are really important to consider as you, um, if you choose this type of tool. The thigh worn accelerometers are great at detecting sedentary behavior and breaks in sitting, but these there are things that can impact your measurement. And these are factors you need to consider up front at the beginning of a study. Now that we've discussed options to measure sedentary behavior, I want to leave you with a few questions to help guide which tool is right for you. Now these questions aren't intended to be an exhaustive list, but rather important ones to get you started. So the first is what is, what is it that you're trying to measure? Starting with the outcome you're most interested and then finding the tool that is best at measuring that thing is going to power you for the most success. Once you've selected your tool, understand whether it's been validated for your population. And if there are special considerations for your population um, in using that specific tool, is it feasible to ask your participants to wear a device for it as long as you want them to or answer questions as frequently as you're interested in? Are there other variables that may confound your ability to measure sedentary behavior, like patients with heart failure tend to nap a lot? And is that going to how is that going to impact your ability to measure sedentary behavior? I hope that these questions and this talk has been helpful to give you some insight into the tools available to measure sedentary behavior and some things that you should think about as you decide on which tool to use. Thanks for your attention, and I look forward to answering any questions you might have in the question and answer session. Great, Jen, that was a great talk, teaching us all about seven day behaviors and the right devices and algorithms and different ways of answering our research questions. I also just wanna remind everyone that uh, we're gonna have two more speakers today, and then we're gonna have a group panel discussion at the very end, we'll, we'll have a question and answer session. So I encourage you to post your questions into the chat board, and I'll be recording those, and we'll have a great question and answer after these next two presentations. So what we have coming up next is Dr. Ben Mailer. He is a postdoctoral researcher based at the University of Leicester. His research interests focus particularly on the role of sedentary behavior and physical activity in the prevention and treatment of chronic diseases, in addition to the development and assessment of analytical methods, which aim to improve the interpretation of quantifying physical behaviors. Hi, my name is Ben Mailer and I'm a postdoc researcher based at the University of Leicester in the UK. My research focuses on the role of sedentary behaviour and physical activity in the prevention and management of chronic diseases. As part of that, I work within a small group based at Leicester specialising in accelerometer data. So my talk today is going to focus on the processing of sedentary behaviour data, but also including some data handling and cleaning procedures that are important to consider. So, as Jen referred to in her talk, posture is an important component of sedentary behaviour. Now, plenty of studies using accelerometers worn on the wrist or hip might refer to inactivity, which is time spent below a particular acceleration threshold during waking hours. But the ability to determine sedentary behaviour based on the posture is really limited to thigh-worn devices. Uh, a study last year was published and reported that uh, if you wear a wrist device and a thigh device at the same time, the wrist device still underreports sedentary behaviour by, by approximately an hour, which is quite a, quite a large uh, bias for, for um, our field of research. So my talk today is going to focus on the, the active PAL, which is uh, widely used in the field of, of sedentary behaviour research. However, I will stress here that um, you could wear any accelerometer, any triaxial accelerometer on the thigh uh, to, to measure the same outcomes. In fact, our research group earlier this year published a paper where we compared four different accelerometers, one of them being the active PAL, uh, that were all worn on the thigh at the same time and found that the, the postural outcomes such as sitting, standing and stepping were similar across the devices. So you don't exclusively need to use the active bell. So for those of you entirely new to this type of data, 
if we asked a participant to wear an active pal, for example, for a seven day period, we would be generating files that were approximately eight to 10 megabytes uh, in size. But then if we were to then uh, decompress this into the raw data format, uh, as, as you get with a lot of other risk-based devices, um, these files can be up to 300 megabytes each in size. So um, one of the first data handling considerations is, is really the, the amount of storage that you need based on the amount of participants and, and the number of times that you're going to see them, because this can quickly um, amass to quite a large uh, storage demand. So the, the data itself uh, can come in a raw format. However, there is plenty of options now with, with the software or softwares uh, to generate uh, alternate ways of, of packaging the data. So you can go right from, from raw based data uh, to epoch based data where the, where the data is summarized for every 5, 15 or 60 seconds. Uh, and then event based data which is summarized purely by when an event uh, or a behavior type changes. Um, different software uses different formats of this data so some will need the raw, the raw data uh, others just use the event based or, or you might write your own that just uses a, an epoch based um, data format. Um, I've just given a few examples here of some of the the software available that, that I've used or that I'm aware of um, so there is the proprietary software. So for example, ActivePal again has its uh, own software suite where you can where you can uh, download the data, but also generate these types of outputs that I just mentioned. Uh, you also have uh, software like Acti4, which is available on request through ProPass, and that uses a MATLAB um, compiler to to run. Uh, that uses the raw data as well. Um, Processing Pal, which has been developed at the University of Leicester, where I'm from, uh, is a Java-based platform, but that uses the events file, which is a little bit smaller than the raw data. Um, you will also see in some publications uh, reference to uh, in-house processing, which would simply be someone developing their own algorithms or, or their own um, functions to, to actually generate the, the variables of interest themselves. Uh, and there are there are other ones that I haven't mentioned, which I don't have time to today. But um, I'm going to focus on the on processing pal because that's the one that we use uh, within the University of Leicester and the one that I'm most familiar with. So when we've sorted out the device that we would intend to use for our data collection, and we've we've gathered our data and we've got it all ready and on our computer ready to run, uh, we're we're ready to process it. And this stage can vary drastically in terms of the time commitment based on the approach that we use. Um, I just want to point out that although we're gathering objective data, it's very common now in the cleaning uh, of the data that we do apply some level of subjectivity um, and, and we'll explain that and explore that as, as we go through the, the demonstrations. Uh, it's really important that uh, all the procedures that we, we use are explained in a transparent manner in our methods because it can mean the difference between uh, comparing results from two different studies based on how you deal with this data before you analyse it. So thinking back to the definition of sensory behaviour, um, we said that it's, it's done in a waking state. So the, The, the first thing that's important to us really is to is to se separate the waking and, and non-waking data. So what you quite often see uh, in in the software or at least um, with, with the approach is that we will either use an algorithm to try and automatically detect where that sleep might have occurred or we will rely on a, a sleep diary. So we'll ask the participant to write down when they went to bed, when they when they fell asleep and also when they woke up. There are some problems with, with this diary. Obviously you're relying on people um, accurately writing this down and, and it's quite often in some studies that you might really struggle to get that, that level of information back or you might not get it back from one participant at all. And if you don't, how do you then deal with their data? Do you completely ignore it or do you use something like an algorithm to, to predict when they might have been asleep? So. Um, I mean, a recent paper by Carlson earlier this year actually compared uh, a sleep diary to, to two different algorithms. One of them is the processing PAL algorithm, 
and another one was from uh, the Active Pal software itself. And they found that the, the agreement between those two algorithms and what someone actually writes down was between 89 and 95%. So it's, it seems to be fairly accurate, and especially seeing as it saves a lot of time to run through these algorithms. Um, however, there are obviously pitfalls, um, the same way we struggle to understand how computers, or at least I do sometimes, um, how they work. Uh, the, the algorithm sometimes isn't as accurate for some participants based on their behavior particularly I've found with, with restless sleepers or people who are highly sedentary individuals who might not meet the normal uh, criteria for, for what we deem to be a, a, a normal day. Uh, and then you also have the added problem, particularly with some shift workers, where they might have multiple sleep windows in a day and, and how an algorithm can detect that. So um, the important thing to point out is that the algorithm or the, the, the diary, neither of them will be perfect. So what um, Carlson recommends within their paper was that a, a blended approach of the two is, is, probably, is probably for the best. So what we'll do when we go through our software is show how we use an algorithm, but then we also refer to the sleep diary and we, we really do just check the quality of the algorithm um, in terms of how it's performing and, and see whether we want to make some manual adjustments based on what the what the person has told us. So the approach I'm going to talk about is, is the uh, approach mentioned in, in Winkler in 2016. So this was um, where they validated their algorithm for identifying the sleep window. And it's based on a few criteria. So th the first uh, criteria is that it looks for at least a five hour period of continuous sitting and we then assume that that is, uh, is, is the participant sleeping. So it finds that five hour window and then what it does after that iteratively is looks at the um, maybe 15 or 30 minute windows either side of that five hour block to extend the sleep until it finds patterns of normal waking behavior. Um, and there's also some other caveats. So if someone takes less than 20 steps, um, then, then that would allow the algorithm to assume it was just sleep that was briefly interrupted, um, for example. Or if it was followed by, if someone woke up but then sat for more than 30 minutes in a, in a, uh, in a continuous bout, then they probably are still asleep. And uh, the typical sort of uh, criteria that we use for a valid day in our participants is that they've taken at least 500 steps um, over a 24 hour period, and also that there's at least 10 hours of waking wear. So that's just, um, it's not based on anything other than what we know about human behavior. And these are the sorts of things when we look at the software that you can see that you might change these based on the population of interest. So here I've opened up Processing Pal, which runs through Java. And what we'll do is I'll just show you a few files um, and how we would run through that um, process of applying an algorithm and then determining how well the algorithm performed. So uh, there's just three participants that I'll include here. Um, we can see down on the left here, before we actually hit the Analyze button to run the algorithm, uh, we can actually change the criteria of, of how we want that algorithm to behave. So this 300 minutes for the longest bout is, is that five hour window that I just mentioned. And you can see things like this um, 20 step break, uh, which I, I also mentioned. So if someone takes, if someone wakes up in the middle of the night to go to the toilet and they take less than 20 steps, then uh, the sleeping window won't be interrupted. Uh, we typically always ignore the first and last day of, of our data analysis as well because we start the, the, the data recording uh, in the middle of the day and we're only interested in 24 hour behaviours. And then lastly there's this validation settings at the bottom. So I just mentioned two of these which is that uh, a 24 hour window should have uh, 500 steps completed within that 24 hour window and then there should also be a minimum of 10 hours waking data. Uh, finally, we also put this cap on that you can only spend 95% uh, within one activity during the day because to stand up for 95% of the day is, is um, unlikely and therefore is probably the case that the participant has just left the device 
um, laid a certain way so that the the posture says they're standing when in reality they're not wearing the device. So these can be changed um, and you might change them based on your population and, and what you know. For example, if you have a, a very frail um, population, the minimum number of steps might actually be lower than 500 just based on their inability to engage in much physical activity. So that's all customizable. Um, we'll then hit analyze and this will just run those three files nice and quickly. And what we do at this stage is we run straight to the, the heat maps and what we're going to do is look at how this algorithm has performed for us. So we can see with this participant, all their waking hours data is, is in this heat map on the left and all their sleeping data is on the right. So going from uh, midnight up to 5.45, we can see the participant seems to be waking up around that sort of time, uh, Monday to Friday, um, which makes sense to us because these were in office workers that, that did work Monday to Friday. We see that they had a lie-in um, on, on the Saturday, Sunday, also on the Friday there as well. Uh, and then we see that their, their uh, sleep times when they're going to bed is, is between half past 10, 10-ish and, and 11. Um, so the consistency there is, is nice to see and normally would say to me that the algorithms detected the correct behaviors. If we look over to the right, we can see a few small green strands throughout uh, the, the sleeping data here and that's referring back to this um, 20 step break in sedentary behaviour that I spoke about. So on the Saturday here we can see that the participant has probably woken up at about 4.30 um, to use the toilet and then gone back to sleep for another few hours. Um, so that's where the algorithm um, is really good at detecting that. We'll look at the second participant Again, we see fairly consistent sleep and wake times. Um, on the Friday here, our participant went to bed after midnight, but that's fine. We can always check the, the, the wake and sleep diaries to, to check that that was the case. We see that, again, they're not working Saturday and Sunday, so they've had a bit of a lie-in on that day too. And again, we see a couple of instances where they've woken up during the night, um, but it hasn't interrupted that waking window. And we'll just go on to our third and final participant. So we can see, in general, it seems to have performed quite well. Um, there is this block here that's uh, ringing alarm bells for me though. So currently the algorithm's predicting that this person woke up at about 1.45 a.m. Uh, and stayed awake until 11 o'clock. Now, based on what we see on their other days, they've woken up closer to 6 a.m. and that's when there's the next level uh, amount of steps here so the the likelihood is here that this participant took more than 20 steps when they went to the toilet or let the dog out and therefore the, the waking window wasn't carried further so within the software this is where the subjectivity part comes into play if we're measuring sedentary behavior currently for this day the participant has just under four hours uh, extra sedentary behavior because the algorithm deems this to be waking behavior. So that's quite a, a large bias there. So in this case, I would look to check their diary and assuming that they'd put 5.45 as their waking hours, um, I would then seek to manually adjust this so that it was correct. So there is a simple function in here. I, I won't go into uh, how to do it, but um, you can essentially find where the uh, behavior occurred and tell the uh, software that we want to mark that particular time frame as sleep. So I'll add that, I'll click on update, and then hopefully when we go back to our heat map, when I hit refresh, that window's now been removed and taken over to the sleeping window. So I'm much more happy about that. There are some instances up here later on for this participant as well where they might have either been sat watching television, which was quite common in this group, or they might have actually been asleep but just woken up a few times in the night. So I might check that in my diary as well as I'm going through this. So once we've made any manual corrections that we need to do, 
Uh, we've now got the data in a state where we're happy that the waking data has been segregated from the sleeping data. And what I've done here is I've pulled up the proposed uh, ProPass accelerometry construct, which was published last year. This is a really useful resource that I uh, refer to um, normally weekly when I'm dealing with this kind of data, just to remind myself about the possibilities of, of what could be done. So we see in dimension E here, there's a biological state, and this is what we've just done. So we've separated uh, wake time from sleep time. Um, if we then look at the top, we can look at intensity zones. So although we've got uh, sitting uh, being the main focus of this talk, um, there's obviously also standing and stepping of various intensities and, and running as well. So we can look across different uh, intensity thresholds. We've then got posture types uh, and bout durations as well. So particularly for sitting, we, we quite often look at periods of short sitting and then also these prolonged bouts which seem to be more detrimental to health. And then finally we've got the domain. So I'm going to focus on work and non-work here. Um, if we have a diary where people have told us that they're at work or it might be that you're researching um, adolescent school children, um, so it might be in school and outside of school, we can, we can look to generate variables for, for each of those domains. So just a brief summary from me really is uh, there's no correct device or even software or method when it comes to analysing sedentary behaviour. Uh, in terms of data cleaning, just some advice. Um, a systematic approach is really important. Uh, make sure that you're keeping a log of any decisions, whether that's changes to uh, algorithms or manual corrections, just so you've always got that to look back on. Um, for consistency, particularly within a study, it's always best practice to keep the same person analysing the data. Because there's that level of subjectivity, it's really important uh, to reduce the bias between multiple people who might interpret what they see in a different way. Uh, finally, for, for data analysis, remember there's so many variables and, and ways of looking at the data now. Uh, when it comes to your research question, you really need to think about what combination of these variables best answers your question. So I hope that this overview I've provided over the last 20 minutes has been helpful in showing you uh, some of the considerations needed when handling and cleaning sedentary behaviour data. But more excitingly, um, the possibilities of what you can actually do with data now to help answer your research question. Uh, I look forward to answering any questions that you have after Seb's talk in the Q&A session. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Miller. That was a great presentation on how to uh, handle data and different aspects of consideration. Uh, before we move on to our next presentation, I want to encourage and remind people that we do have a Q&A session after this last presentation, and we'll have a nice discussion between all three panelists. And so if you have any questions, go ahead and please post them in the chat, and I'll record them to make sure that they get asked during the uh, discussion section. And I know there have been a couple that have already been answered, so I encourage you to follow the chat for more information. So our last presentation today is from Dr. Seb Chaston, who is a professor of human behavior dynamics at Glasgow Caledonian University in Ghent University. He devoted his early work to understanding the dynamics of rest and activity sequences. As such, he worked a lot on the analysis of sedentary behavior. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. I'm Sebastian Chasten from Glasgow Caledonian University, Ghent University, and Vascular University. And I'm delighted to be here with you, and I would like to thank the uh, Sedentary Behavior Research Network for putting this seminar together and inviting me. Lauren um, asked me to do a talk about analyzing sedentary behavior. I was really immediately um, worried about raising expectations. Um, essentially, when it comes down to analyzing sedentary behavior, it is a question I have very often, which is, wh what is the best way? And, and there's no such thing. It, there is no panacea in it. In fact, analyzing sedentary behavior really depends on, mainly on two things. What, what is really your research question? What are you interested in? Are you interested in the volume, in the pattern of sedentary behavior? Are you as, 
interesting in putting together some uh, cohorts, maybe some association. Are you trying to detect something or discriminate between groups? Are you trying to see if sedentary behavior has changed as a result of an intervention in an RCT? Um, it also very much depends on the measurement of your sedentary time, because the measurement essentially is going to distort reality uh, to your point. And I refer you to that excellent um, uh, review uh, published recently by uh, Simone Borema uh, around this, where she digs into this a lot. So before we go there, I think it's important to understand a bit more about uh, sedentary behavior itself and within the lens of human behavior dynamics. Essentially, life is a sequence of events, of choices, and some of these choices are sedentary behavior. And our human behavior is not run like a clock, it's actually incredibly bursty. It's been shown for just about every aspect of our daily life. We do things in burst. Uh, we walk in burst, we write emails in burst, and most of the time in between this, we have a, a pose. And most of these poses are sedentary behavior in the kind of rest or activity. And that burstiness means our behavior has dynamics that are non-linear and that don't really conform to what we usually do in statistics using a kind of linear models or a simple normal distribution of this kind of thing. The only other things to really take into account is the fact that sedentary behavior is also dependent and connected to other behavior. We have only 24 hours in a day, which means when I'm sedentary, I am not something else and vice versa, which means that when I record sedentary time, I'm also recording non-sedentary time or the sum of uh, moderate to vigorous activity, light activity and sleep. That means that every time uh, the, the idea that sedentary behavior is uncorrelated or can be studied in isolation from the, this other behavior is a little bit floor from the start. And we have to bear this in mind at all time because otherwise we make unrealistic assumptions. And we have to remember that sedentary behavior is an overarching term and then there is many types of them. And those might have very different consequences on our health, or uh, we might have to change them in, in a different way. So it really depends on also the type of sedentary behavior you're trying to tackle. And I refer you to uh, the taxonomy we've developed uh, around sedentary behavior to help classify these times more effectively to uh, improve research in that respect. And so we invested time in developing this uh, as a consensus. And we are welcome uh, addition and, and, and updates on this. So <clears throat> let's start first about volume. Uh, so it's a quest, quest, the kind of questions we want to ask about how much people do or how much is associated with. Um, the first thing to, to think in this is that we can actually harmonize our measurement a little bit. And again, my group at the Glasgow Cato University invested uh, um, a lot of time in de developing kind of harmonization structures for this. So we developed a, a taxonomy for self-reported uh, sedentary behavior tools, and we then validated that against uh, active power times, which is probably what is the best kind of gold standard in terms of uh, sitting time measurements. And then we give you in a second paper uh, a systematic comparative and validation of self-reported tools against the active file, but you can do the same with other uh, objective monitors and simple equations that just take away any kind of um, systematic error due to under-reporting or over-reporting um, and it enable you to actually harmonize it. The second step is to think uh, in terms of compositional data. As I said, sedentary time is actually connected to the other ones, to the other behavior. So that means that sedentary behavior volume is actually a compositional data. It's not on its own, it's, it's relative to the rest of the time of the day. And there's been some real progress in this done over the years in terms of 
analyzing this in a compositional way, which means you analyze the relative contribution of the volume of sedentary behavior, and you are able to adjust your models for the other behavior, which is R, which is also important. Uh, I refer you to the latest paper here in the Journal of Physical Activity and Health as part of the World, of, World Health Organization guidelines uh, uh, special issue. Now, now we look into pattern, and that's what a lot of people are interested in. And we have to, as I said, because of the bursty nature uh, of human activity, the periods of uh, sedentary behavior are <clears throat> not distributed normally. They are actually distributed as a power law, which means we have a lot of um, very short bouts of sitting that contribute very little in terms of the total volume, but instead also we have very few, um, very long bouts of sedentary behavior that contribute a great deal to the total volume. And that's the, 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 the distribution you can see at the bottom. So there is a, an iniquity, if you want, between the, the frequency of really short bouts that contribute little and the, the, the very few number of long bouts that contribute a lot. Um, and we have to take this into account uh, in our analysis because it's significant for the behavior, but it's also significant for the statistics we use. So in pattern, the problem is we always try to break this down into frequency and duration. But because of that distribution, this is actually terribly difficult to untangle. Uh, so what I've seen over the years in papers and various uh, studies is people have tried this. So uh, let's let's break this down if we can. So frequency, we're all familiar with this concept of breaks. That was really a breakthrough by Genevieve Ely, and that was a, a wonderful thing. But if we analyze the concept of breaks a bit more, we realize that breaks is also the number of bouts. And e, that will be an indicator that would depend entirely about on your recording length. If you have two sets of, uh, the same set of data, I advise you to do this experiment and reduce the, uh, the recording time artificially uh, by cutting your data series, and you'll find that your number of breaks changes. And because we often don't control that recording time, that means that indicator is not terribly robust. And if we think about the connection between sedentary behavior and the other behavior due to the 24 hour encapsulation, we also have to think that breaks in sedentary behavior is also the frequency of light activity. And sometimes I see papers that analyze both things Put them in the same model and don't realize that it's actually the same um, the same cons construct. So it's not terribly robust. Uh, to improve this a little bit, we can uh, normalize uh, the, the number of bouts to the recording length, and this is essentially the fragmentation index, uh, and it's a little bit be better. Uh, uh, you normalize the number of breaks to the total sedentary time. We have also, I've also seen people have attempted to calculate the probability of transition. So, you know, how am I likely to transition from a state of physical activity to a state of sedentary behavior? That's a really clever idea, but when you analyze it mathematically, actually it is the same as the total sedentary time. So we're back to square one. Um, if we go to duration, uh, people often calculate a mean, uh, about length, so that, that is a no, normal distribution type of mean, and that is essentially undefined, so I wouldn't advise that at all. Uh, instead, we've proposed to use the average uh, about length, or also what we call the half-life about, about length, uh, sometimes written down as W50. It's also what you think about the most likely about length in a, in a person's patterns, and is weighted to this power law distribution. To take into account in this imbalance. So it's a little bit better an indicator of, of duration. But what we often favor is to use uh, combined indicators. So indicators are based on the distributions. So in when we have a normal distribution, we can characterize the distribution by the mean the standard, and the standard deviation, and that tells us everything about what's uh, inside that distribution. For power law, this is uh, characterized by a single number. So that's really nice, um, which is called alpha, it's the exponent. And it's the most robust indicator you can have over a pattern of sedentary behavior. 
Uh, we've also proposed to, to use the Gini index because it's related in that you can actually calculate one from the other, but it's it's useful in some places, but it's not so easy to interpret. Um, finally, I've seen a lot of, uh, of uh, studies that have used cut points, so they'll count the number of bouts a bit of 20 minutes and or 30 minutes and make make bins like this. And those essentially are uh, arbitrary. And if you change these bins, you might change, see a change in results. So it's not terribly robust. And I wouldn't advise that. Better to use the, the, the distribution uh, altogether and use alpha. So that gives you a, a scope of the different type of pattern uh, metrics that have been um, that have been developed. And now we have to see how, which one to, we might want to prefer using. And it's often the case, actually, we found that uh, if you are trying to do your analysis, to do the analysis on the pattern metrics, and then try to calculate after that what that entails for volume or frequency of bouts, because you can calculate that back. Uh, but do the statistics on the uh, pattern metrics because they tend to be more sensitive. And there's been a, a really nice study done, done by John Pelletier in 2017 around what was the best uh, metric to use for cohort studies. And he found that the exponent of the distribution alpha is gives you more sensitivity in terms of detecting associations. And you can still uh, calculate a chain a difference in volume if you wanted to uh, track him back on your data. But in terms of getting a, uh, in terms of getting a, um, a discriminant uh, or an inferential statistics, it's better to use alpha. In terms of sensitivity to change, uh, uh, for like RCTs or this kind of things, we uh, investigated that in 2015 and we found that the half-life bout is probably better. Uh, you can understand that pattern uh, is probably more sensitive because if you're trying to change sedentary behavior, to change the volume of sedentary behavior, you're gonna have to change the pattern. And then particularly, you're gonna have to change these longer bouts. So, it makes sense that it's the bout duration that is going to be this kind of more sensitive and we just have to get a good statistics for this. In terms of discriminating between groups or trying to develop phenotypes or that kind of thing, uh, I would think at the moment uh, the Gini index is probably the most sensitive indicator you could use. Now we can also look at uh, analyzing type of context of sedentary behavior. We have better data using maybe cameras or these things or, or questionnaires or this kind of thing. And then for that, we can use the standard sedentary behavior taxonomy, uh, the C taxonomy. And I invite you to, to go and have a look at a paper done by my colleague at Ghent, Sophie Copernoli, who looks at the difference in context specific behaviors and digs a bit more into the type of behavior and what their, their association with health are. And this is actually done within a compositional context because you can imagine the different type of sedentary behavior actually makes a composition of the total volume of sedentary behavior. Uh, <clears throat> so essentially that's, that's a, a, a whirlwind tour of different ways of analyzing sedentary behavior and what might or might not be uh, better but I encourage you to really think about what you want out of your analysis. Set your questions carefully, understand your measurement, and understand, more importantly, the data. Look at the distribution. Look at the way they are um, changing as, as a consequence of different processing problems. So thank you very much for listening, uh, and I'll be happy to take uh, questions either now or uh, through email. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shaston. Great talk. And so I think now we're going to move on to the next phase of our conference, and we're going to have a live Q&A with all the panelists. And so I'm going to start off with a question for Jen, Dr. Blankenship. Uh, 
which commercial advice do you think is best to use in research? And I think a follow-up question with that is someone asked is, is there one that's best for measuring a daily step count? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And, um, you know, I kind of always, I, I always go back to that, you know, best is really dependent on your application. So um, in terms of, you know, you can define best by, you know, what's the least expensive monitor that I can get to get a, a somewhat decent measurement. So I, I would, you know, I hate turning around the, the question to back to the person, but, you know, what is the level of um, accuracy that you're looking for and, and what's the error that you're willing to accept with a commercial monitor um, and, and these um, consumer grade devices, there's not, you don't have as much control over the output. So what may be validated to have a certain level of accuracy in uh, Fitbit today may not be that what you get tomorrow because they can change things like algorithms that they use to output their steps or firmware um, and and you just don't have control over that so you know I think um, it's important if you're thinking about using uh, these types of devices um, that you you understand that it comes with a grain of salt um, but it's probably going to be better than asking somebody you know how many steps did you take if you're interested in an objective device that um, people might be really happy to wear. Considering that, how transparent are these commercial devices, the companies that make these commercial devices? Do they like publish some information on their website or is there some place like a central resource to go and like try to figure out what's going on? But probably by your smile, I'm guessing that. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I think that kind of information is is really difficult, and um, you have to remember the context of uh, Apple and Fitbit and Garmin. They're all competing with each other and have a vested interest in keeping what they do under lock and key. Um, I think you know there are ways to get a little bit more information um, by contacting these. Uh, device companies, and um, there's often some kind of science team that that does this work. So um, I, I think it's difficult to get it uh, just by a, a search on, on the internet. Thank you. Dr. Mailer, I have a question for you. Is there a published consensus on what aspects of data cleaning should be reported in the methods section? Or is there a, like a consensus on like what kind of, what level of transparency needs to be uh, published? Uh, good question. Um, so I've provided a link to a paper by Charlotte Edwardson, which spoke about specifically with the active pal um, using that. And, and that does provide some information about the, uh, the type of, of detail you, you should provide with your methods in order for the, for the um, data to be reproducible. <clears throat> so you're looking at um, things like minimal wear time. So what, what a valid day looks like, um, the, the number of days is, is also a, one that is sometimes up for debate. So whether you include someone who has provided you with uh, two days of valid data, for example. Um, so uh, in most of our studies, we'll include people that provide a minimum of four. However, you, you I mean, in the past, we've run sensitivity analyses, looking at the, the two uh, below four and above four, and it doesn't normally change the, the outcome of, of what the study finds. Um, yeah, so I think I think um, those those types of papers like like the Edwardson one are a really good starting point. Um, and then I think our field's quite good in sedentary behavior field's quite good in detailing that in the methods uh, now. So I would I would have a look at any recent paper as well and see what they've included. Great. And then, the software that you showed us, does it require any prior knowledge in coding or is it, can we like, in a, we pick it up off the street and just start clicking and playing with it? Yeah, so I just had um, a brief chat uh, with Audrey about this um, uh, in the Zoom chat. Um, so Processing Pal and another software like Acti4 uh, basically hide the code for you now. So uh, even going back three or four years, uh, Processing Pal itself was an algorithm that you had to run through Stata. So it's all you know, a big, bigger uh, document full of code, if you like. 
Um, but that's now uh, hidden. So it, there's now a user interface and, and you saw me using it. I'm, although I'm changing different variables, I'm not having to, to write long streams of code. So uh, in my opinion, that's really good. It's made it much more accessible to, to research groups that don't have um, you know, expert knowledge in, in whatever uh, coding syntax that their institution has. So um, yeah, Processing Pal and, and Active 4 definitely don't use it. You also have Pal Technologies, which have their own um, software that allows that. Great, thank you very much. Um, I know we've had a lot of questions in the chat, so I'm sorry if I don't get to ask your specific question, but I'm sure that uh, you would be able to email any one of these panelists or get your question asked if I don't ask it. So I'm sorry again if I don't ask all the questions that have been popping up. But um, I noticed that uh, for Dr. Chastain, I know Audrey asked this question and you answered in the chat, but I think it's a good one to answer live. Do you know if any of these variables you are proposing are implemented in the ProPath software presented by Ben? I don't actually, uh, I'm not sure. Last time I looked there, why not? But uh, Ben might know of updates that I don't know about. Um, so I think, Ben is probably in a better position to answer than I am. I um, think the short answer to take your time is, is no <laughs> at, at the moment, hopefully in the future. Great. Well, we'll stay tuned for that. And then uh, Dr. Blankenship, do you have any thoughts on about placing an accelerometer on the ankle? That's an interesting wear location. Um, you know, in the context of sedentary behavior, I think it's... Um, you know, perhaps we have some better solutions uh, that are one acceptable to participants, which I think is a central question. You know, are you gonna, I, I don't wear anklets anymore, even for fashion. I don't know how many people are gonna wear a uh, big clunky device, even if it's a little bit small on their ankle. Um, you know, it, it can be an interesting location if you're interested in things like, you know, how quickly can, um, are people moving their uh, extremities? So this might be important for uh, particularly uh, clinical populations that have lower limb um, mobility problems. But in the context of sedentary behavior, I think you have other options. I mean, I haven't personally used it, um, but those would be my thoughts. Thank you. Uh, now I'm looking in the Q&A and we have an open question there from, uh... Quack, and I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, but would anyone be comfortable to use one of the commercial devices to detect the sleep for active pal data to get the awake slash non-wake separation? I think the question, so I think you mean, could you use another device to determine wake and sleep and then use that those times within something like processing pal uh, yes you can um so there is a function where you can essentially in a spreadsheet write down the, the dates and times of, of wake and sleep uh, we've also used it for things like uh, looking at work hours only we obviously have to ask people when they're starting or finishing work so it works on the same concept so that that could be could be done that way yeah definitely thank you very much i think we have reached our uh limit for questions during this session right now. I want to really encourage everyone to reach out to these panelists if you have more in-depth questions or want to converse with them more about how they approach their science. I'm sure they'd be open to talking to you about it. So I really uh, encourage you to do that. And now I want to uh, pass the, the, the remaining of the time to Dr. Aoki so he can uh, describe future events. Yeah, um, thank you for, thank you to everybody for attending today's uh, webinar. Um, once again, I'd like to uh, that after this, we have a series of webinars to follow for the next few years. Um, and it will be nice to see if we all come together again and be part of it. Our next uh, Serenity Behavior Council webinar will try to be building an international database on sedentary behaviors. Uh, the time, the date is uh, 14th of February, 2022, 8 a.m. We are going to push out this information to everybody as we go along the course of the month. Um, 
it will be chaired by myself. Uh, we'll be able to uh, uh, get everybody together to again so that we can have a good time. And we have other planned webinars uh, along along the uh, the months uh, following. We have uh, some other ones like uh, the determinants of sedentary behaviors, which will be in 13th of June, 2022. We have pathophysiology of sedentary updates over the past four years. Uh, address the third one, the fourth one will be address ethics of sedentary throughout life cycle. And the fifth, update on effects of sedentary behavior on cardiometabolic diseases. And then we will finish up with uh, um, update on intervention on interventions efficiency. Um, we would like all of us to uh, come along and uh, be part of these great webinars, which will enable us to have more information about what our council is all about and the latest development in sedentary um, I would like to remind us all again that it would be nice if you can all try the members of uh, ISPA, uh, it would be really great because we can have access to uh, all these par recorded webinars for the, uh, the member section. Uh, we can also benefit from latest, latest news from each part and councils first. It gets to us first as members. Uh, it will also help us to have access to online resources and uh, become part of the Serenity Behavior Council. For free, and if you are each part member, you will be able to join the Serenity Behavior Council for free. And then you'll be able to join our mentoring program, which uh, has been a great endeavor trying to get people together and get mentored properly. Um, I'm, uh, I'm uh, trying to invite everybody to be part of uh, ISPA and part of the Media Council, which will help us to meet up with uh, all our demands and everything we need to learn about Serenity Media Council. Um, thank you for joining us today. Hope to see you soon. Have a great day. Bye.